Well, I think it's in times of suffering that we're more inclined to long for the return of Jesus. And as we sang that song, I was just reminded, and I know in, in, in the broad scope of history, the measure of suffering that we experience today is probably nothing compared to what others have experienced. And yet, we feel it. And uh, those of you at home so miss you. And I know, I know you're there because you need to be there because that's what's best for your family. So I just want you to know that uh, we definitely miss you and I know you long to be here when you can and uh, we look forward to that day. But that is part of that suffering where we're driven apart by, um, by matters that are outside our control. But the Lord is in control and, and we're grateful for that. Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation but be of good cheer. Be happy. I've overcome the world. Christ has indeed overcome the world. Well, I would invite you to turn in your Bibles, uh, our Bible text for this morning as we continue in this series on, on our church's core values. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 12. In the church Bible, there's some uh, in the racks in front of you, if you choose to use one of those, 1,023. 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 12. I'll give you a moment to turn there in your Bibles. Let's give our attention to God's word as it is read. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Would you join me in a prayer? We'll ask for the Lord's help. Our Father, you know our weaknesses. You know how easily we are distracted. You know what we're made of. And so, God, we need a divine help even now as we have read this truth together. Its application in our hearts and our minds is, is the work of your Spirit. And so, cause us each to be willing and ready to hear from you. And Lord, as I often pray, I know that a mere man cannot uh, declare the oracles of God to any eternal value. What needs to happen is something that no man can do. And so we ask for your spirit to have full freedom in this room. Now, make that happen. Give us ears to hear, hearts that are ready to respond in faith and repentance where necessary. Lord, I pray that glory would go to Jesus. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Well, as I, as I mentioned, today we're continuing in our series in Core Values. And this is part of a larger uh, series that we're, we've been engaged in, mission, uh, vision, values. Um, these core values are things that, that matter to us as a church. They matter to us because we believe that they matter to God. That's really what these, uh, where they find their anchor point. And in as much as we as a church live out these values, we believe that we are being the kind of church that God wants us to be. Now, I'm giving focus to these values because it's important that we, that we nurture them among us. Last week, we focused on the values of Christ-exalting worship and the sufficiency of God's Word. And what I touched on last week, I want to make sure that, that, we, that we understand very clearly, is that these values are the outworking of the gospel in our lives and in, in, in our church. We as a church, Overland Hills Church, exist because Jesus said, I will 
build my church. That's Matthew 16, 18. And the way that Jesus has built his church, the way that he has formed us together is by opening our eyes to the truth that we are sinners under condemnation and God's wrath because of our own sin and because of our own rebellion. But, but, and this is how we're formed as a church, but because we understand that there is a God who is rich in mercy, he is the one who sent his son to become a man. God sent his son to die the death that we deserved. God sent him to die in our place. And because he died in our place, and then because he rose from the grave on the third day, we who believe, we together who believe, and we can affirm that in each other in as much as we hear each other's testimonies about our faith, but we who believe we have received forgiveness and eternal life in the name of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. That is the good news by which we are saved and set apart. Now, this church, this church, Overland Hills Church, we are a collection of people who believe and want others to grow in that truth. So we believe this truth and we want others to grow in it as well. So because of the gospel and for the sake of adorning that same gospel, we embrace these core values. Now, as we turn our attention to the Bible text that we read together, we see that the love of God is the reason for our love for one another. God has loved us, therefore we are to love one another. Verse 7, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So setting up a a kind of a, a condition, a scenario. If you are born of God, if you know God, then you are to love one another. In fact, it is assumed that we would love one another because Whoever loves has been born of God. And because God loves us, because those who he loves are born of him, we have both the obligation, but also the ability to love one another. We have the obligation, but also the ability. Now, who is this one another that our, our uh, John the Apostle writes about? Who's the one another? Well, he certainly has in mind fellow believers. So as we think about the local church, the one another is us. We look across the room and we see one another. We look next to us. We see one another. But also consider what it says in verse 11. If God so loved us, we we also ought to love one another. So if we truly love the way God loves us, then that love must extend to those who are not known to us including those outside of the family of God. That's the logical outworking of this. So in light of the fact that we are recipients of God's love, we are recipients of this transformative power. This is part of the grace of God in our lives. We therefore extend that same love to others, those others that we know well in the church family and those we don't. Therefore, The love of God compels us to value the outworking of that love in two things. And these are the core values I want to focus on this morning. We value the outworking of that love in fellowship and hospitality. We value the outworking of God's love in our lives when we practice, when we engage in fellowship and practice hospitality. And if we value these things, it means we'll nurture them too. So, simple outline, two headings. The first is we value fellowship. We value fellowship. Now, uh, if you're like me, you get that this word fellowship is a kind of a churchy word. I get that. Uh, The church where I spent my childhood up to my young adult uh, adult years, we had a a fellowship hall. Uh, What happened there usually involved coffee, cookies, and Kool-Aid. Do they have have Kool-Aid anymore? Does that exist? I don't know. But we had that. Uh, So in in my mind, from a young age, I associated fellowship with a light snack after the evening service. Uh, The word fellowship, though, is sometimes used outside of the church. I get that. Uh, An example you may be familiar in the academic setting, a fellowship is an honor bestowed on someone for the sake of, of participating, and that's the key word, participating in a larger research endeavor at a university. But when we come back to the Bible word fellowship, Fellowship is essentially this. There's a, there's a word that you may have heard in the original language of the New Testament, koinonia. 
Fellowship is that word that it, it gets translated as fellowship. It's essentially partnership or participation. Communion is another word that could be used or, or simply sharing in something together. But what is that something in which we share or participate? And hopefully the answer is obvious in your mind already. The answer is love. It's love. It's God's love that motivated his saving us. God's love motivated that. He, it says in verse 10, loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. It's a big theological word, but a great word, meaning a, a sacrifice that absorbs or averts the wrath of God. So, so get this. God's love towards us was not merely a, a disposition or a feeling, but it was actualized, was it not? It was actualized through him sending his son to be that sacrifice that ultimately deals with his own righteous wrath for us, for our sin. God's righteous wrath would befall, uh, would befall us because we are sinful in and of ourselves. And yet God sent his son to be the propitiation. That, that disposition of God was not merely a feeling, but an action to deal with our own sin. And that very love is what brings us into fellowship with God. Paul says in, the, in 1 Corinthians 1.9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, if we think of this word fellowship, in, one, in what sense then do we have fellowship with God? In what sense? Now, we've already said that, that this is uh, it's a love that no longer counts our sin against us. His love, God's love, takes care of that record of our sin. His love for us vacates the guilty verdict and grants us a divine pardon that lasts forever. That's the extent of God's love. But that love and the fellowship that we have with God does more. It not only deals with the legal matters of our unrighteousness before God, it deals with matters in the present. It changes us. It renews us. It, it does that work in our lives of transforming us over time. And here's how, here's how the Apostle Peter explains it in his second letter. This is a, a section I go to often. 2 Peter 1, 3 to 4 says this, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life, and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that, hear the wording here, through them, through what? The promises, that's the word of God, through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Become partakers in the divine nature. See, everything, according to Peter, for life and godliness, that comes to us through God's promises. That's fellowship with God. Corruption that is in the world, sinful desires, those things are the opposite of love. And John makes the case, if we come back to the, the John's letter here, 1 John, he makes the case in this previous chapter, we didn't read it together, but that if you make a practice of sinning, that you, that you don't really love God, nor do you love your brother. But because God loves us, we can love one another. Because we have fellowship with God, we can and must have fellowship with one another. So in, as it regards love, and we think about that loving one another, think of it this way. If love is this disposition towards one another in the church family, fellowship is the practical outworking of that disposition among us. So if love is that 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 priority we have for one another, that, that's, that disposition that says, I value you, you matter, I care about you. Fellowship is the outworking of that disposition. 
So as we consider fellowship then, because of the love of God for us, therefore we love one another, as we consider fellowship the outworking of that love among us, I want to give you five ways to think about and nurture fellowship in our church. First of all, fellowship is intentional. It's intentional. Now, uh, I have a Harley uh, motorcycle. Kathy wants me to sell it. Now, I'm not really ready to do that right now. But she has a very good reason for that suggestion. I've not ridden it much. It just sits there in the garage, and perhaps the battery's dead. I don't even know. Now, in my mind, I still enjoy riding it, but there have been so many other things that seem to have been a priority. So to Kathy, it seems that I don't seem to be that into it, like I used to be. If it really mattered to me in her mind, I would devote myself to it, give it more time, right? Well, isn't it true? Things that matter require intentionality, planning, thinking, organization. And the same is true of fellowship. We've got to be intentional about it. We have to decide. Uh, I, we, we could take our example from, from the early church in Jerusalem. Uh, this is just after Pentecost. Uh, the Apostle Peter uh, Jesus had been raised from the dead, ascended to heaven. A period of time went by. They were told to wait. And the Holy Spirit just invaded that, that group of people and they spilled out into the streets proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. And so many were converted. And it tells us in Acts 2.42 that all of those who were now disciples of Jesus, converts to, to faith in Christ. Verse 42 of, of Acts 2 the author there, Luke, tells us, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's the, the teaching of the word of God. But the second one is, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and prayers. They devoted themselves to fellowship. Let me ask you, are you devoted to fellowship? Are you intentional about fellowship with the church family? Well, secondly, to give more meat on this skeleton here, fellowship is sharing. Now, we see an example given in the, in the book of Acts just a few verses later. This is how it looked. This is how their fellowship looked. And all who believed, this is Acts 2, 46, sorry, 44 to 46, all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Now, we don't want to take this too far. Some have wrongly concluded that the example of the early church requires us imposes upon us the, the, the imperative of selling everything we have and then pooling our resources. But understand what happened there. This was a voluntary generosity. It wasn't imposed upon them. They were compelled by fellowship. They were compelled by their love for one another. And when they saw need, and there was profound need, they responded with generosity. So fellowship is sharing. Do you have something do you have stuff? Do you have time that could serve a brother and sister? I know we live in a time when there's a fair amount of prosperity and maybe people don't need our stuff, but do you have time? Fellowship is sharing. Third, uh, fellowship is interdependent. Interdependent it means that we need each other. Um, 1 Corinthians 12 the Apostle Paul explains about the church. He says, Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. That's verse 2. Down to verse 13 it says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves are free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. Let's skip down to verse 21. Continue with this body metaphor. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. 
Now, the imagery is supposed to be obvious to us. Parts of the body don't speak to other parts of the body and say, you're unnecessary. Fellowship means love for one another expressed in fellowship. It means that we understand and we need each other. You can't look across the room and see another church member and say, oh, unnecessary to me, peripheral. It doesn't matter. No, when, when you see the church family and you look around, even if you don't fully understand, that other person has an essential role in the body of Christ, an essential role in your life. Fellowship is interdependent. Fourth uh, aspect of fellowship. Fellowship is mutually submissive. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Ephesian church, he was instructing the believers there to walk in love. So we're in the same theme here. And in so doing, that would inform all of their relationships. Wives, husbands, children, parents, slaves, masters. And you can think, you know, in, in our, our modern day, a relationship between employer and employee. And he talks about submitting to one another in Ephesians 5.21 submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Because we revere Jesus, because of God's love, because he has loved us, we love one another. We express that love through fellowship by mutually submitting. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like deferring. It looks like putting others first. It's look, it looks like humility before them. Fellowship is mutually submissive. And finally, on the matter of fellowship, fellowship is missional. Missional. Jesus, in his high priestly prayer, as it's called in John chapter 17, he prayed for our unity. He prayed for our oneness. He prayed for his disciples and he prayed for all those that would come to believe through their witness. And we have the New Testament. That's their witness. So if you're a believer in Jesus today, know this. 2,000 years ago, in the company of his disciples, Jesus prayed for us. And he prayed that we would be one. And here's what he says in his prayer to the Father. That they may be one even as we are one. That's profound. The oneness that Jesus has with his Father, Jesus said, may they know that one with another. May they be one, even as we are one. I in them, so Jesus in us, and you, Father, in me, Jesus prays, that they may become perfectly one. Now, we could stop there. But I said, this is missional. Here's what Jesus says next. That they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Do you hear that? Our oneness, our biblical fellowship says something to the world. It says that God sent his son into the world. If, if there's ever a moment when you think that being at odds with another church member is going to be okay, that, that you would somehow carry that on and somehow be an enemy, that you wouldn't have fellowship with some other person in the church family and think it's unimportant, hear what Jesus says. May they be one so that the world will know. And I take the opposite to be true, the converse of this. If they are not one, the world will not know through them that you sent me. Hopefully you find that motivating. I do. When we have true fellowship among us, it adorns the gospel. It makes the message of Jesus look beautiful.
Well, second, we value hospitality. We value hospitality. Now, this is a little bit different than fellowship, and we'll unpack this. Um, just a little story. We had a, a, a wonderful golden retriever, our family. His name was Ozzy. He was super gentle. Some of you met Ozzy. He was friendly. He was obedient. I almost always walked him without a leash. I would call him. He would come. Now, he wasn't much of a guard dog. And it didn't matter who he met. That person to him was always a friend. And, and I, I used to joke that if, that if Ozzy could talk and a burglar showed up in our house, he would take them to the valuables and say, here's all the cool stuff. Because he would assume just the best of intentions of everyone. I never thought it necessary to train Ozzy to be anything but welcoming to strangers. On the other hand, though, when we think about our own children, and in fact, in our day, when it comes to children, we tend to teach them to be very cautious around strangers, don't we? We tell them, don't take candy from strangers, don't talk to strangers, be wary of strangers, especially in parks. Of course, I, I understand this. We want to keep our children safe. There are predators in the world. We understand that, and this is wise. Now, it is certainly wise to teach our children to only interact with strangers in the presence of adults, their own parents. However, carrying on this avoidance and aversion to strangers as adults is really the opposite of what the Bible calls us to do as believers. We need to be more like Ozzy, <laughs> our dog. Well, we, when we say we value hospitality. The word hospitality itself is literally love for the stranger. Love for the stranger. Now, I know the way in which we use the word hospitality, it's not merely inviting people to your home for dinner. It could be that. It could be. But it's so much more than that. It's really this. It's an attitude that sees the stranger as someone you're willing to welcome into your life and into the church to verse 11 of our text. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So, if God so, in this way, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, certainly here, as we've already talked about, one another is fellow believers, but if we love one another the way God has loved us, that it means that we love them with the hope that God would open their own eyes and their own hearts to their own need for Jesus as Savior. Isn't that the way God loved us? He loved us before we loved him back. Romans 5.8 says, But God shows his love for us in that. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, while we were alienated from God, while we were enemies of God, while we were blaspheming God and fill in the blank. While we still hated God, Christ died for us. See, hospitality displays God's love by welcoming the one who is a stranger to us. It's a welcome of the stranger. A writer of Hebrews says this, Hebrews 13 too, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. There he lays it out. And he gives a reason, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. It's a strange passage, and there's a kind of a veiled reference here to um, perhaps Abraham and Lot in our Old Testament stories. They welcomed messengers from the Lord. They, by these messengers, were warned about the danger that was to befall Sodom. Now, in short, out of this, good was accomplished. They were rescued from the city. Good was accomplished by welcoming the strangers. They were angels. They were God's messengers for good, ultimately for their protection. So the application for us is that God accomplishes good for us when we show hospitality. And that, what that good is, we may not know. I think the writer of Hebrews has something in mind. Generally speaking, some good happens. So who is the stranger? Who's the stranger to you? 
Who's a stranger to me? Well, someone you don't ordinarily know or, or maybe wouldn't ordinarily relate to. According to Jesus, these strangers are included in the second part of the great commandment, which says this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, Leviticus 19, 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Jesus had an interaction with a, a, a lawyer, an expert in the law, and, and for the purpose of self-justification, this lawyer asked Jesus, who is my neighbor when they were talking about this great commandment? Who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus responded, uh, and you're probably familiar with the parable. He shared a, a parable about a gravely wounded Jew being left for dead at the side of the road, and he was helped in his profound need by someone that that Jew naturally despised, a Samaritan. Luke 10, 25 through 37. And what the Samaritan man did was he set aside the fact that he knew that Jews looked down on him and hated him. He set that aside. And what he did in that moment is he showed mercy to this Jewish man. And he paid, he took him and paid for his lodging while he recuperated from his injuries. Now, now we don't experience that that Jew-Samaritan cultural religious divide. That's not our experience. But we do have other kinds of subtle and overt differences that may keep us, that may keep us from associating with others who are strangers to us. So to us, I would say, a Samaritan is simply someone different from us. Whether we are inclined to think of them as less than or not. So... Someone different, culturally. That includes languages and customs. Someone different culturally. The person that moved in next door to you. Different customs do things differently. Adorn their home differently. How do you feel about that? Maybe that someone different is in someone in a different economic circumstance. They... Maybe they live in a different neighborhood than you, or they work a different kind of job, maybe professional versus blue collar. Maybe they're socially different. Or maybe that difference is someone who votes for a different political party. Boy, does our world know how to divide along those lines. Maybe, I'm speaking to you military types, maybe that's the difference between enlisted and officer. Maybe that person is other to you, wherever you find yourself. Maybe it's because of the person's skin color that they are other to you. And this has been a huge concern for our nation, sadly, ripping us apart. The world shows fear for others who are different. The world has become expert at dividing. And sadly, through the centuries, the church has been guilty of some of the same kinds of sin. We have to get hospitality. We have to get love for stranger right. We give a bad reputation to the gospel. We have to check our hearts, I think. Do you shy away from others, from the stranger? I'm so often reminded of the profound differences among Jesus' own disciples. I've said this before. But Jesus commanded them, love one another just as I have loved you. So it's the same command we're dealing with that John includes here in his letter. I'm I'm sure he's quoting from from Jesus in John 13. But think of Jesus' own disciples. There was Simon. He was called a zealot. And if you knew what zealots are in the first century, they're the ones who would, you know, rise up and and take, take back the nation by force. Let's overthrow the emperor. Let's go in with torches and pitchforks and let's let's do this. Simon the Zealot was among Jesus' disciples. But also Levi, Matthew. He was a tax collector. He worked hand in glove with Rome to extract taxes from his countrymen on behalf of Rome. Now imagine these two men in the company of Jesus looking across the room. Traitor tax collector. Levi saying, violent insurrectionist. Messing with a, the peace that we've got. Let's just get together and get along. But whatever they had between them, 
that went away in light of the gospel, in light of Jesus himself, right? And when Jesus said, love one another, he meant, really, love one another. You know, Jesus not only taught it, but he modeled it. Just, just think of the moment in, where Jesus was hanging on the cross, suffering there in the throes of death. On a, on a cross next to him, someone was there, well, in fact, in either side. There were, there were men who could not be more different than him. So let's just pick the one, a criminal, an insurrectionist, guilty of a capital crime, a man who had wasted his entire life in rebellion. And there's Jesus on another cross, the one in the center, pure, perfect, spotless Son of God. And Jesus, looking at the stranger, when his heart is gripped with the reality of who Jesus is as someone who is sinless, Jesus doesn't turn away from him saying, you're just a sinner, man. No, he says, today, you will be with me in paradise. Where I'm going to my Father, you're coming too. The ultimate expression of hospitality. Come with me to my Father's house. You see, hospitality isn't just about being nice. It's about the gospel, isn't it? The Apostle Paul said this. I know I'm quoting a lot of scripture this morning, but Here's what Paul says. In his own understanding of who he is and his pedigree and his upbringing, as a Jew, looking at those who are different, perhaps. He says, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. That is to say, not Jewish. Not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I, what, What would he do? That I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. And he says this, I do it for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. If we love others like Jesus loves us, then we must show hospitality. And we can show hospitality because Jesus' love for us is transformative, is it not? The Holy Spirit is the one who indwells us. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us for the very thing that Jesus commands. Paul says in Romans 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We, that's, he's stating a fact because of Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we think about what hospitality looks like here at Overland Hills Church, I already see it. So let me affirm it. It's it's the greeting team getting here early. You have to set your alarm early. You've got to get here early. Thank you for doing that. It's the logistics team getting everything ready to to welcome people to worship. It's, It's people showing up in the nursery ready to receive the babies. It's church members just looking around the room, looking for that new person. Or maybe the person standing alone and just willing to strike up a conversation. It's church members, and I've seen this, inviting someone to lunch after worship or, or organizing a time to meet during the week. Now, some people use their homes. Others find, find ways to meet in neutral places. But the point is this. Hospitality asks the question, what can I do to make that person that I don't know feel loved. Why? Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. So, do likewise. And I get it. Hospitality is sometimes inconvenient. It can be costly. It can be uncomfortable and awkward too. I know that. Oh, but it's worth it. Well, why do all these things matter? Because the mission that Jesus has given us is to make disciples of all nations. 
leading people, as we say, to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And it begins here. And so because of our mission, because of that mission, if the Lord should bring anyone across our path, anyone, and most especially in this building, we have a responsibility to them. If they are unbelieving, to somehow, some way, introduce them to Christ. And if they're already believers, to help them grow in His grace and knowledge. We do this. We show hospitality because Jesus welcomed us. And so what do we do, brothers and sisters? What do we do? Well, it begins with prayer. I need this. And I think about my own interactions with strangers out in the world. I so often forget. I so often forget. Just putting a priority on the thing that I need from that at this particular time. I so often forget there's someone that God may save. So I've been praying lately. God, make me a welcoming person to those I don't know. So I encourage you to do with me. Pray. And then when you pray, take a risk. Look for an opportunity to show a kindness. And as I said, hospitality can sometimes feel awkward and strange because your attempt may be rebuffed. It's okay. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. Take others along or go along with others who are already figured out how to do it. We value fellowship. We value hospitality. Now, the writer in the end of this section tells us, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God's, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. We, I think we all want that. We want his love to abide in us, but we can't see God. But John tells us that, that his love is demonstrated among us when we love one another. So when we are intentional about fellowship, when we are intentional about hospitality, loving others, loving one another, and showing love to strangers, that's a beautiful evidence that we are children of God, and may that, may that be the kind of, of church that we are. Let's pray. Father, the, the word that you have spoken to us calls us to something that we are not able to do on our own. And we thank you, Father, that by your grace you have poured that love into our hearts. I pray you would just make us ready and able and willing and, and eager to demonstrate that kind of love and so be the kind of church you want us to be so that we adorn the gospel, so that the world will know that you have indeed sent your son into the world to be savior of the world. He is our savior and we want others to know him that way too. May it be so. We pray it for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to share around the Lord's table. And uh, so the way we're doing this this morning is uh, I'm, I'm going to frame our discussion here uh, or frame the, the celebration of the Lord's table around the scriptures. But um, we have, uh, because of COVID, we have these um, compact little bread and cup combo kits here. <laughs> um, so Bobby's going to play some music in a moment and, and, and just encourage you to come up to any of the three tables and, and, and take for yourself. But I want to frame it before we, uh, before we take the, the bread and the cup together. The Apostle Paul, in, in teaching the church at Corinth, they had gotten hospitality wrong. <laughs> And it was a really ugly example of how things went off the rails, in particular in their celebration of the Lord's table. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, sorry, did I say 12? I meant 11. 
But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. In the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe in part that there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Now, I've never seen that here. But the point is, what, what Paul is doing is saying, don't go down that road. What the Holy Spirit is saying, treasure fellowship. Because we're going to come together in an expression of unity. We're going to receive from the hand of Jesus, by extension, across the centuries and through the pages of the Scripture. We're going to receive from the hand of Jesus bread and a cup. And he's going to tell us what it means. The Apostle Paul continues, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he's betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, in giving this instruction, because they had sinned so greatly against one another, Paul said, look, you've got to examine your hearts. Don't be flippant about this. Let a person examine himself, it says in verse 26, then, then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So while the music plays, uh, while you anticipate coming forward, let me encourage you, believers in Jesus, examine your hearts. This is the body of Christ. It's just bread, but it represents the body of Jesus. And in as much as we receive it this morning, we're saying to everybody else, I'm part of the body. So it's, it's kind of an expression of our fellowship with Jesus and one another. We don't do this at home. We do this when we're together. And when we receive the cup, the fruit of the vine being red, representing the body of Christ, the covenant that Jesus made through his own blood, that because he died, our sins can be forgiven. That's what we're taking to heart as we receive it this morning. Let me lead us in a prayer and um, come forward when, at any one of the tables when you are ready to and we'll receive it together after some other words and instruction. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed set this thing up for us setting a pattern for us. Do this in his remembrance. And so, Lord, we are doing that this morning. And we pray that your spirit would confirm the gospel truth in our minds and in our hearts through these very tangible elements of bread and wine. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for calling us to yourself, to fellowship with yourself and with your Father. Help us now fully appreciate and delight in what you have accomplished at the cross. May you be glorified, Lord Jesus. Amen.